once around the Ashton meteorite. Ashton is on the border of Cambridgeshire and Essex in the UK, sleepy little village by comparison with many places, even today, as a few views of the uh, lovely place there with Ashton Hall Farm on the left and a view down the footpath, which will become important later on in the story. So back in March of 1923, so just over 100 years ago, Frederick Pratt, who was a Thatcher aged 36, was working away at Ashton Hall Farm out in a wheat field. Now, we're not entirely sure uh, what he was doing. He could have been uh, cutting hedges. He could have been doing all sorts of things. Nobody really knows. It's not documented. But at one o'clock, so I imagine he was probably having his lunch, he heard a sissing sound, as he described it, overhead. I thought perhaps initially it was an aircraft, but the noise sounded more like a projectile, an artillery shell going over. Um, and then just 30 yards away from him, he saw something hit the ground and a spray of soil fly up into the air like a jet of water, he said. Three days later, he returned to the site with a shovel and his friend, and they were able to dig up what is now called the Ashton Meteorite. Pratt was able to chip a piece off it with his digging equipment and check what it was made of just to make sure that this rock they dug up wasn't just a random piece of flint uh, from the chalky landscape, but was something very different indeed. And clearly it was. So he decided he'd better do something with it. And what he decided to do was to take it to the local police station. And the police didn't care. They were not interested in some strange man bringing them a small rock. So he took it home. But then very wisely, he showed it to the local vicar, Reverend Francis Berry, now, Berry was ex-Trinity College, Cambridge, very well educated, and recognised the importance of what uh, Pratt was saying, not only the look of the rock, but also the description of how he'd found it um, and observed the fall. And observed falls of meteorites are very rare indeed. So Berry bought it. We don't know how much money changed hands and then donated the thing to what is now the Natural History Museum, the Mineralog Mineralogical Department of the British Museum, as it was then known. And the man he gave it to was this guy, George T. Pryor, doctor, keeper of mineralogy and meteorite expert, renowned across the UK at the time. And he uh, did some work on the object, concluded it really was a meteorite, very fascinating object, and decided he'd better pay a visit. So he came up to Ashton with Pratt and the Reverend Berry. They then visited the site and were able to find the smaller fragment that Pratt had knocked off whilst attempting to ascertain whether it was just an ordinary rock or not. Now, today, the remains of the Ashton meteorite are held in the Natural History Museum as a scientist, wearing gloves, of course, because you don't really want to let the acid from your fingers get into these rather rare objects. And uh, you can see the chipped face where the fragment was cut off, where uh, Pratt hit it with a shovel to determine that it wasn't an ordinary flint. And inside it, you can see some of the structure of the uh, round grains and so forth inside the rock, just in that photograph. Now, they've got the main piece, but there are a number of replicas around. In fact, there are three painted plaster casts, one in the Saffron Walden Museum, one in the Ashton Museum, and one at the Essex Field Centre uh, at the Watt Tyler Country Park at Pitsy. And so these are very, very realistic, painted to look like the real thing. And they show all the same surface details, of course, being plaster casts. So uh, it gives you a good sense of what the object was really like. And the surface shows the signs of the passage through the atmosphere coming in at uh, high speed, 12 kilometers per second, that's eight miles per second, roughly. That's very fast indeed. 
for much faster than a rifle bullet, then while still in the high atmosphere, 300,000 feet, 100,000 meters, it would have glowed like a fireball, creating this enormously bright streak in the sky, ionizing the air, leaving a trail behind it. And uh, that heat would have melted the surface, creating this black fusion crust, as it's called, sort of glassy crust over the surface, around about a millimeter deep at its thickest part. And you can see the way that the leading edge bore the brunt of the uh, passage through the atmosphere and was most strongly melted. And then molten glassy materials were then streaked back across the surface to make what's called flow ridges, very characteristic of a stony meteorite like this one. Now, it uh, would have been slowed down high up in the atmosphere still. So by the time it was down to about 100,000 feet, this would be moving at no more than a few hundred miles an hour, terminal velocity for the altitude, and would have fallen through the cold air and down onto the ground, maybe at 250 miles an hour still fast enough to be a problem if it came and hit you, um, and indeed to bury itself in the ground in the earth of the wheat field. Now, at the time of the fall, the surface would have still been warm for a few minutes, but the interior of the meteorite would have still been at the temperature of deep space, because it really did not have time for that surface heating to penetrate into the interior and that would have been at about minus 250 degrees and so very rapidly the heat would be lost and uh, actually you would feel this as cold if you picked it up after a couple of minutes after it had hit the ground so the meteorite was then analyzed six by nine by 12 centimeters weighing 1.3 grams uh, sorry 1.3 kilograms originally but of course pratt had chipped a fragment off and another piece had gone for analysis. So there's just 1.27 kilograms in the main fragment now. And looking deep inside it with a micrograph here, you can see the felspar, the pyroxene, and of course the greenish yellow olivine crystals. There are specks of nickel iron metal alloy and chondrules indicating that these are original beads from the early solar nebula. And overall, it's been classified as an L6 chondrite. Chondrite because of the chondrules being present. And L6 tells you something about the type of meteorite. So the main classes of these chondrite meteorites, L means low iron, so less than 10%. And most of these seem to be from one particular enormous impact event around about 468 to 470 million years ago out in the asteroid belt. So in the mid Ordovician era, either the parent body of the entire flora family or the uh, asteroids Eros or, and flora or something to do with that entire group of asteroids created these L chondrite fragments that all then came as a shower to earth and actually 466 million years ago, so just 2 million years after creation, they fell to Earth um, over a fairly long period of time and created a considerably uh, nasty extinction of life on Earth, uh, blotting out many, many families and species of creatures. The LL chondrites, LL means low, low, not very imaginative, but it means there's very low iron um, in these. These are much rarer. Uh, Chelyabinsk was an example, as is the asteroid Itokawa, which we have samples of after a sample return mission as well. And then you have the other end of things, the H chondrites, H for high, so 20, 25% iron. And these are uh, the most common type. And we think that these have an association, again, with a cosmic train wreck involving either the asteroid Hebe, Juno, or Iris, or possibly all three of them um, out there in the asteroid belt. So many of these types have been blasted off the surface 
or are the result of completely destructive events that created these families of asteroids out there. So that's the letter. So we have an L chondrite. In this case, it's L6. And the numbers run from one to six, and they tell you how much the material has undergone metamorphosis, how much recrystallization due to the pressure and temperature deep inside a larger body um, has altered the material. And so L6 is the most altered and therefore from the deeper layers inside a fairly substantial body. So again, backing up the idea that there was a parent body that was shattered and that uh, many of these L chondrites come from different layers within that body. And this came from one of the deeper layers of the uh, rocky part of the body itself um, and probably uh, was part of that enormous impact maybe 470 million years ago. There are also signs of alteration by water. So perhaps initially as ice, the heat generated by radioactivity within the parent body very early on in the highly radioactive environment of the early solar system would have been able to melt that ice and then the water interact in various aquifer pockets within the body itself and hydrate the minerals of the composition of the rock. And such hydrated asteroids impacting the Earth may have accounted for the later delivery of a lot of the water that goes to make up the Earth's oceans. So this meteorite um, falling in a wheat field picked up by Fred Pratt, um, was really very, very scientifically informative. Now, 100 years after the event was di discovered in the first place and Pratt saw what he saw, so 2023, the rock was allowed to return to Ashton for the day. And here we've got two of the local geologists and a scientist there holding the fragment for this uh, centenary celebration. And plans were put in place and a marker was erected, a wooden post labelled up with the impact site just where this came down. And this was unveiled on the 100th anniversary of the event itself. Where is it? Well, it's just next to that path. You can actually walk down that footpath that I had in the first slide marked on the map there. So you can visit Ashton, go down through Church End, find the footpath, walk along it and just where it turns to a right angle near Little Hayes Wood. That's where the post is, and you can go and inspect the site if you really want to. Um, that's the sort of crazy thing I might try and do. And just to finish up then, we've got the Ashton meteorite marked on our map over, not the one at the extreme right, but the one nearly rightmost in the uh, middle, just north of London there. That's the Ashton 1923 event and some of the others. And roughly, we get about one every 10 years meteorite falls over the UK. But this one was very special because it was a witnessed fall. Fred actually saw it come down, and that does not happen very often at all. If you want to read more about it, the Saffron Walden Museum has this book, The Ashton Meteorite. It costs £3, I think, so it's very cheap, uh, by Gerald Lucy and Mike Howitt. 24 pages, and talks in a little bit more detail about some of what went on. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that little tour of this fascinating witnessed fall. Thanks very much for listening.